Nitrogen present in meat processing wastewater are termed a nutrient since they are essential elements for life. They largely derive from proteins dissolved into wastewater from meat tissue, blood, paunch liquid and stockyards. Nitrogen is stringently regulated in Australia. These limits define the levels that the wastewater treatment plant must reliably achieve and to some extent which treatment technologies are most appropriate. Regulatory limits vary widely throughout Australia. For river discharge, they are usually negotiated on a site-specific basis, taking the limiting nutrient of the river system and the catchment. In many parts of Australia, direct river discharge is not an option. Some limits are concentration-based, others may be expressed as load-based limits, especially for land irrigation. A range of technologies exist for reducing nitrogen concentrations in meat processing wastewater. The first three technologies in this table use bacterial biological nitrogen removal activated sludge processes. Biological nitrogen removal technology is preferred for river discharge and land irrigation, where nitrogen limits are strict. Biological nitrogen removal can be harnessed in a range of reactor types including continuous biological nutrient reactors, sequencing batch reactors and aerated ponds which are a less intensive form of continuous BNR systems. The first two technologies will be the focus of this video. Dosed DAF technology is commonly used for sewer discharge. Anaerobic ammonium removal technology and struvite are emerging technologies An activated sludge biological nutrient removal process achieves nitrogen removal in a two-step process. Step one is the nitrification process and is a multi-step reaction. Ammonia-rich water from upstream cows or anaerobic lagoons is converted to nitrite by ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Nitrite is further oxidized to nitrite by nitrite oxidizing bacteria. Nitrification only changes the form of dissolved nitrogen in the wastewater, but it is an essential first step for removal. The nitrification process must occur in an aerated zone where oxygen is available. COD and BOD levels are kept as low as possible. Step 2 is the denitrification process where nitrate is reduced to dinitrogen gas by denitrifying bacteria. The nitrogen gas escapes the wastewater into the atmosphere and thus removes the nitrogen from the wastewater. The denitrification process occurs in the absence of oxygen and requires high levels of biodegradable COD. The environment required for each step is radically different. The two technologies provide these two different environments in different ways. In continuous biological nutrient reactor processes, nitrification and denitrification are performed in different parts of the reactor. An example is the BioLAC process, where although the denitrification zones are not separated by walls from the nitrification zones, there are distinct areas allocated for each reaction. This requires the constant circulation of flow between zones to complete the reaction. In sequencing batch reactors, nitrification and denitrification occur in the same reactor space but at different times in the cycle. For example, the aeration system turns on for the nitrification part of the cycle then switches off during the denitrification period. This saves the need for pumping large volumes of liquid around or for separate structures such as clarifiers. Provided the appropriate environment is present, the relevant bacterial will perform the reactions needed to reduce nitrogen levels. The main components of a modern, continuous biological nutrient reactor activated sludge systems include an anoxic denitrification basin or zone. This basin or zone continually receives several streams, including the main feed of ammonia-rich wastewater from the upstream cal or anaerobic pond. This is a large volume stream containing the bulk of the new nitrogen load to the system. Unfortunately, the COD content of this stream is usually insufficient to provide all the COD needed for the denitrifying bacteria, so additional COD is added. This can be an external carbon source such as ethanol or methanol, but this is expensive. Most systems divert a portion of the raw primary treated wastewater to the anoxic basin to supply the carbon needed. Since this stream bypasses the upstream cow, it is often termed the raw bypass. For some systems, this can be as high as 25% of the total wastewater flow. The return activated sludge is usually pumped out of the base of the clarifier. 
This ensures fast rates of treatment. Denitrifying bacteria also require nitrate, which is not present in the raw wastewater feed and must be supplied recycled from the downstream aerated basin. In the Biolac process, the upstream aerated zone provides the nitrate-rich water for the downstream anoxic zone, so there is no separate recycle stream. The basin is usually mixed in a manner to minimise the presence of oxygen, for example with submerged mixes. In the anoxic basin, denitrifying bacteria catalyse the conversion of nitrate to nitrogen gas and consume COD in the process. The loss of nitrogen gas to the atmosphere removes it from the wastewater. The wastewater continually flows out of the anoxic basin or zone into the aerated basin or zone, which maintains high dissolved oxygen concentrations. The acid released by the nitrification process is neutralised by the alkalinity generated by both the upstream cal or anaerobic pond and denitrification. The contents of the aerated basin flow continually into the clarifier. In the clarifier, the bacterial flock settles out of the water column in the still environment provided. The treatment effluent overflows the clarifier, usually through some kind of weir system, and should contain low total suspended solid levels, typically less than 20 to 50 milligrams per litre. The settled sludge is pumped out of the base of the clarifier and split into the sludge to be recycled and sludge to be pumped to the dewatering plant for disposal. In red meat, processing wastewater treatment plants, the dewatering device is typically a belt filter press or decanter centrifuge. The sludge stream is injected with a suitable polymer which promotes large stable flocks for dewatering. The mixture is pumped to the dewatering device which removes large quantities of water from it and generates a dewatered sludge cake. Ideally, this cake should have a consistency somewhat like wet cardboard. Filtrate is returned to the head of the system. The sludge cake is disposed to an appropriate waste management facility such as composting or landfill. Continuous biological nutrient reactor activated sludge systems have low maintenance requirements, are relatively robust and easy to operate, and can achieve a high effluent quality. They are, however, not very flexible to changes in wastewater volume or quality, have high operating costs, produce large amounts of sludge, and require large volumes of wastewater to be circulated. Skilled operators are also required. Sequencing batch reactors undertake the activated sludge process in batches. Rather than performing the anoxic, aerated and settling processes in different specialised tanks, each with their own equipment, all stages in the sequencing batch reactors are performed in one tank or pond, but at different times. Note that the same biological processes are used, only the reactor is different. In a sequence batch reactor, a time-based control strategy is employed. This strategy is built around a cycle, consisting of a number of phases. Each of these phases establishes the environment conducive to the process required by controlling the entry-exit of streams and operation of equipment. This is automated using PLC control. Once the sequencing batch reactors has completed a cycle, the cycle clock resets to zero and the sequencing batch reactors repeats the cycle with a new batch of wastewater. A close analogy to the sequencing batch reactors is the domestic dishwasher, that is, one batch of dirty plates per cycle with time-separated rinse, wash and dry phases. Waste activated sludge must still be removed, usually using a pump to withdraw sludge during aerate and fill phase. WAS is dewatered in exactly the same manner as for continuous biological nutrient reactor plants. Sequencing batch reactors have a high degree of operational flexibility to changes in wastewater or quality. Since the sequencing batch reactor operates using one tank, it does not need an expensive clarifier and sludge recycle streams, which usually require large pump and pipe circuits and thus lower capital costs. They do, however, require a decanter mechanism which operates during the decant cycle to remove clarified water. They have a high degree of automation and a smaller footprint and produce high effluent quality able to meet current and anticipated future discharge requirements. They do, however, have a higher level of control required compared to continuous biological nutrient removal plants and require knowledgeable and experienced operators. They also require an upstream storage to hold wastewater during phases when wastewater may not enter the sequencing batch reactor. Typically, an upstream cal or anaerobic pond is used for this, or twin sequencing batch reactors are used in parallel. Direct regulatory requirements concerning nutrient removal will be stated in the facility's environmental protection license, permit or approval which is issued by state government. 
The main focus is usually on minimizing the risk of odor, especially from biological nutrient removal systems and the appropriate off-site transport and disposal of the dewatered waste solids. Activated sludge biological nutrient removal systems require daily operator attention. Sequencing batch reactors also require daily operator attention, but at appropriate times in the cycle. Operator time is usually spent monitoring performance. Activated sludge biological nutrient removal systems are extremely responsive due to their relatively short hydraulic retention times and their high bacterial concentrations. Consequently, it is important that their performance is monitored daily, especially where the treated effluent must meet stringent quality limits due to river discharge or high quality reuse. Operators of the dewatering devices need to operate several times a week to remove and dewater the WAS from the system. Sludge dewatering behaviour is complex and affected by many factors including pH, weather, sludge settling behaviour and many more. Consequently, some time is needed to ensure that the right dewatering conditions and polymer addition levels are established each time the device is operated. Failure of sludge to settle is a serious problem and urgent action is needed. It usually leads to increased total suspended solids in the final effluent. Sample and test settleability of sludge from aeration basin at least daily. If settleability changes markedly, notify your supervisor immediately. Aerators and inlet and outlet pipes and pumps should be checked regularly. Check for increasing levels of scum, foam, crust or mousse that looks like fat or pavlova mixture on the basins. This may be a sign of bacterial bulking. Inform the supervisor to determine the course of action. Check any chemicals required are available. It is critical that any changes to system operation are made in a considered manner and in accordance with the designer's operating parameters.